Okay, hello and welcome everybody to our October office hours. Um, this is the last Cloud Network Community Office Hours of 2024, so thank you very much for joining us. We will resume uh, in January. Um, as most of you know, these have been happening on the last Friday of every month, so it doesn't quite work with um, Thanksgiving schedule in America and for the holiday schedule in December. So I am excited uh, about this month's topic. I know in general, we have steered away from uh, vendor specific topics, but it would not be an Aviatrix office hours without talking about Aviatrix. Um, so this month we have Nathan Pierce on. He is a senior principal product marketing manager, what a mouthful, um, at Aviatrix. And he will be talking about how to transform your networking challenges with two key use cases. So with that, um, I will introduce Nathan, and I will also introduce my co-host, Shazad. So if you've been on here before, you've seen Shazad before, um, he will serve um, as the one asking questions to Nathan. Um, Nathan has some exciting talk, talk points, talking points um, laid out for us here. Um, so quick reminder about office hours. Um, my favorite thing about this program really is that there are no rules. So you are welcome to take yourself off mute at any time um, and ask questions. You can also ask questions in the chat. Um, this is your office hours, um, really meant to bring the experts, if you will, uh, like Nathan, uh, together with our community members. So with that, I will kick it over to Shazad and Nathan. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Katie. All right, thank, thank you, Kitty. So yeah, I'll just uh, say a few words and then we'll just get this thing going, man. Yeah, so again, thank you for joining. Uh, as you guys know, if you're new, um, maybe not, so I'm Shazad Ali. I have been in the industry for so long that I can even count the number of years, so that's totally okay. Yeah, so today we are gonna be discussing some uh, exciting topics and we'll see you know what's happening in the cloud industry out there, right? So there are a number of customers deploying the, the workloads in the cloud, and then we have a new technologies like AI, Gen AI also coming into the mix. So it doesn't really matter if you are a seasoned network architect or if you are just uh, dipping your toes into this technology, we will make sure that you have something valuable out of this session, right? So today, like I said, we'll discuss about the cloud networking challenges, and I call them limitations, to be honest, because uh, like anything in the world, there are limitations and we should be just, you know, very open about it. As an architect, uh, we are engineers. We need to make sure we know about them and we we design uh, accordingly, properly, right? Uh, given the choices that we have, okay? So with that, let's uh, welcome our special guest, Nathan. And I'm just gonna start saying, hey, Nathan, it's your first time on here, right? So yeah, just tell us about who you are, what brought you to Aviatrix. Well, um, who am I? I like walks <laughs> on the beach, poetry, unicorns. Uh, so I, this is, this is let's let's keep it about networking. Uh, I have many hobbies and interests. <laughs> I I I started in the Novell Netware three BSD Unix kernel hacking era. And I, I know what you're thinking, but Nathan, you barely look a day over 25. We all thought you dyed your beard gray. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> I'm that old. Uh, BSD4, no, uh, Netware 3, coax terminators. Woo -hoo! Since then, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I got to say 80% of that journey has been what we now call traditional slash legacy networking models. I mean, you racked and stacked and you were pretty locked in. You new features were added to equipment here and there, but didn't evolve a lot. We're still using TCP IP. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that's kind of static and then, then cloud happened and it all changed. So I've worked for multiple multi-billion dollar kind of traditional networking companies, several startups um, that were kind of bleeding edge. And the, the thing that really attracted me to Aviatrix, why I'm here, having worked at both ends of those scales, like the bleeding edge that the kind of market's not really ready for and the traditional that isn't really agile enough for cloud, 
I just feel Aviatrix is right in the middle of those two. It's in the perfect position where it was born in the cloud. It's not a lift and shift of a hardware operating system into a VM. It was made in the cloud for the cloud, but it's not on that crazy science experiment bleeding edge. This company's 10 years old now. So it's got that perfect kind of balance in the middle. It was designed and made on cloud, but it's not a science experiment. <laughs> like this thing works. We've got lots of big companies that are using it in production and it's magnificent. So yeah, it was great having been either end of the kind of pendulum swing there of networking uh, innovation evolution, like Aviatrix for me was just, it was that perfect, perfect place. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Hey guys, so if you don't know the rules, there, there are no rules, like Katie said, all the time. So if you have a question, you can go off mute, can be on camera and ask question. So just to uh, get things warmed up here, I'm gonna ask another question and then you guys can you know, also chime in or ask yours. So Nitin, like I said, there's a lot going on in our industry these days, right? So what's the most interesting thing or moment or thing that you especially are passionate about or working on? I mean, for me, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I, I know we hear this term way too much, but I'm actually really interested in seeing how AI is creeping its way into networking. Um, okay. th this, th I'm, I'm not just, you know, peripherally interested. I actually took five months off, but for joining Aviatrix so that I could go deep into kind of AI R&D, like I was doing a lot of uh learning uh, and training and uh, of AI models and just really trying to understand kind of what the applications might be into networking and various other areas and seeing where its weaknesses were. And what, what I think that the important thing to clarify when you're talking about AI in terms of networking is the differentiation between AI for networking and networking for AI. And at the risk of sounding a little Dr. Seuss there, but they have very different things. And I've seen many times two people having a conversation about AI and networking. They're talking about each of those two things, thinking the other person's on the same page. It's really important to clarify which one you're talking about at the beginning there. And then I'll explain what those are for those who might not be so familiar. Um, AI for networking, that is like AI actually being involved in the operations of networking. So it could be analytics, it could be making changes, it could be reshuffling workloads based on what's going on. And then networking for AI, that is, okay, I've got all this data that's in my private environment. I need to somehow securely and very quickly be able to get that data to where I'm doing my LLM training, which might be like Amazon Bedrock or something like that. And how can I securely manage that, but in a really high performant way? Because we all know doing that over an IPSEC tunnel, going to stop that dead. We're often talking about many gigabytes, even terabytes of data. So that's those two areas I think it's important to differentiate that networking for AI and then AI for networking, which is sometimes called AI ops in networking. A okay. little controversial. I don't really think we're seeing any AI ops yet. We've seen some interesting AI in analytics, but it's not really handling operations. It's that next step that I'm really excited to see where it's taking action based on its observations and learnings of those analytics versus just giving you, you know, like a natural language uh, interface to analytics. Like I want, I want to see that next step now where the AI is just like, hold on a minute. I just witnessed this. I'm going to go make this change. And I, I think there's a stepping stone. Sorry, you guys just said. No, it's just, just, wow. I mean, this is very deep actually networking for AI and AI for networking. And then you actually have this connection with the AI ops. And then now you're talking about the next level where, you know, the AI is, taking actions on your behalf, a little bit scary to me, to be honest, like. Rise know, of hey. the machines, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, th th that, that's got a, its roots in a lot of the um, IPS systems. You know, basically I'm seeing some anomaly, I'm going to react that way, um, mm. which is terrifying. That's been around for a long time and we, we've done experiments with it, but it's like in production, no, you can alert us and tell us, but we're not just going to let you run off and go and start arbitrarily shutting things off um, because the requirements, you know, because basically that's a, that's the danger with it because it's like, it's very easy to paint yourself with networks, especially long distance networks, you know, WANs, very easy to basically, oh, I've just cut off my access to the control plane on it. Um, so that's something that's yeah. an area of concern. R really good point, Rob. And there's two things you immediately made me think of there. Um, so the first one is we've seen exactly this 
thing before when the whole DevOps movement came out and everyone talked about continuous deployment. Mm. But really what happens, most people just got to continuous delivery and then a team deployed because they needed to go check security and they need to check these things. So there's, I think there's implementations where you can have all of that intelligence and automation and insight at least come up with the model and the pattern of what it thinks it should do and then yeah. say, hey, this is what's going on. I need you to hit that big green button and then yeah. I'll go roll it out. But yeah. don't, we're not quite ready for, I can take a nap and you can reroute my yeah. entire yeah, no. cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah uh, very cool. Uh, yeah, no, advi uh, basically, as AI advisor is basically probably the rather than actually, it, you know, actually autopilot actually taking it on its own is yeah, yeah especially, and, especially with the bigger systems, it's risky. And I think we're seeing the same fear cycle with with AI. Everyone's just like, that's not going near my network. And I think that's an overreaction. There's a lot. Of, it can look at all your logs and let yeah. you know what's going on way quicker than you can. Like it's absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But, it, you know, it, it's all the edge cases and the weird stuff. And, the, you know, a lot of it requires is expectation on greenfield sites. You know, we know exactly what's going on in here. There is no squirrely thing done by Kevin, the intern, you know, six months ago that we actually don't know is in there. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So um, very good discussion. I love it. Any question from the audience? Uh, I see folks. Yeah, go ahead. Mari, can you please uh, unmute? Ah, yes, hello. Uh, hey. Hello. Ah, yeah, um, I had a question. Um, so I'm currently looking to learn more about how to use the aviatics technology in practice. Um, that is, I'm looking to get some practical experience, which is a bit difficult here in Germany where I'm located because there are not so many projects using it, or you need to have a lot of experience already. So I was wondering, does anyone know maybe some open source projects or some other opportunities uh, where there are maybe possibilities to get some practical experience next to my day job? Yeah, so I, I can take this. And Nathan, if you want to chime in. That's definitely your, hang on, sorry, I'm pointing the wrong way. You're that side of you. <laughs> yes, that's your wheelhouse. Go for it. All road leads to me, whether you, you know, where, where, wherever you are, whichever box you are in. So, yeah. So basically, no. So we have a couple of options, right? And some of them are really great. And some of uh, them where you have to basically do a little bit of uh, uh, work on your side as well, right? So the first thing first is that the Aviatics is available in all major CSPs, right? And um, in AWS, we have an offering going on right now where we will actually make it uh, for 30 days for free, right? So there is a trial going on. So if you want to get your hands dirty, right, you can just go to the CSP or AWS marketplace. There is a controller virtual machine and the Copilot virtual machine that you deploy in your own AWS account, right? And this is where you can start playing with the with the part, right? That's option number one. The option number two is that we have awesome Aviatrix Ace trainings where we actually give you your individual lab part very expensive lab parts. And then you basically deploy those use cases on your own, right? So we give you this access, you have the controller co-pilot, you have the whole data plane in there. You have all the use cases that we talk about. We have a you know beautiful looking lab guide with all these steps in there. So that's gonna be your option number two. The option number three is something called the sandbox starter, Aviatix Cloud Sandbox Starter where again, it's a virtual machine sitting in uh, AWS, like EC2 instance. You deploy the virtual machine, you get the UI, nice looking UI. And then within the UI, you just need to specify your AWS account information and you click hit deploy, right? So once you do that, it's gonna deploy the Aviatix gateways, the transit, the spoke, the test instances, and that's also something you can use to start your journey into the world of Aviatrix. Yeah, so I already got a number of certifications, including this uh, automation specialty one where you do indeed uh, get like this thing started from the CSP marketplace. But I'm looking for more like a community project with multiple people that are working on something that runs a bit longer because it just has a bit mm. more tangibility to them, like be able to explain to clients like, yeah, I've actually done this uh, over a longer period of time in this context. Um, right. Because just saying I got some certifications is not very convincing, in my opinion, to 
like proof that you can actually do this? Yeah, so there are communities available. We have our own um, community.aviatics.com where you can come and then ask people about, you know, their experience and other projects maybe uh, I'm not aware of. But to me, you know, the best thing is to work with the real product, right? Community is good. I like it. I like open source for sure, no doubt about it. But you need to have someone helping you um, in terms of support and, and uh, you know, the, the whole uh, networking community around it, right? So I would say use the Terraform, deploy the resources. When, once you're done with it, delete it. I'm pretty sure if you have done the AS automation, you would have seen the, the cost. It's not very expensive. It's like, I don't know, uh, 76 uh, cents or maybe $1 per hour, something like that, right? And in, with, the, with the free offering that we have, 30 days are, are obviously for free for the trial. But that would be my suggestion. Well, we can we connect, you know, offline, and I'll I'll see if I can find something for you, which is like long. Yeah, I mean, the, the question was mainly if there's like any active open source projects uh, running that you know of where Aviatrix is being used, where one could participate. Mm. I'm not aware of it. Sorry, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll check with the other team members. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now let's uh, get back to the you know, so Nathan. Mm. I know you are talking to a lot of customers, right? Because obviously mm -hmm. you're both part of the same team, right? What is something special you're working on lately and why? And how is it helping solve those CSP limitations? So my focus, you're observing right now my inability to both type and talk. I was just throwing a question in the chat. Okay, Nathan's back. Uh, I... I have spent the last couple of months working on a very specific problem that is quite small. It's quite narrow in, in its technology scope, but as a problem, it's huge. Um, so many people suffer from it. And this is managing egress cloud traffic. And I think the problem comes about from the fact that there is an easy button that's that easy to just, when you're creating a, VPC or a VNet, it's like a checkbox, just throw an act gateway out. Or if you're using Terraform, it's a single line in that wonderful Terraform module where you just say enable NAT gateway true and boom, I got an NAT gateway. Mm. And it ticks a box. Like my 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 private source IP is now getting translated to reach out onto the internet. But to reach out to what? And to send data to what endpoint to what service and how can I even have any visibility? The NAT gateways are, they're intentionally dumb. They just do that address translation. But then the moment someone says the word data exfiltration, uh, that easy button service, <laughs> that, that gateway suddenly starts to get terrifying. Um, we, we can't, I mean, for a long time in networking, we all just were stuck at kind of layer three and all we we worried more about ICMP floods and, you know, those kind of very loud attacks. That's not the attack. That's not the attack that costs you millions of dollars. It's the quiet attack over allowed ports or frameworks that weren't patched where people get in the moment they're in, then they can do some lateral movement um, and pick around, find some data and then start pushing that data out. And too much of security in the cloud is still oriented around that traditional on-prem castle moat kind of attitude. Oh, we got a firewall. Okay, well, most, most vulnerabilities come in over 443 under the cloak of encryption. So once you're in and you've leveraged like a framework or something, then I can start pushing data out. What's looking at my egress traffic? And that gateway, that's not looking at anything. That's enabling data exfiltration by giving you that address translation on the way out. And again, it's just a construct of the VPC. It's, it's an element of the VPC. It's not even a whole product. You do it in AWS, you literally just tick in a box, I want this thing to be able to allow egress so those services can call out to third-party um, APIs they might need to just do their job or maybe they're downloading a framework from like GitHub or all of the many things or, or allowing an update from our, our private repo somewhere. Um, that's 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 how you get data out through that same service. And, and yeah, it, it's... It's incredible how many global 2000s are just using that NAT gateway is like, okay, check, check it, the service worked. 
and then they're putting firewalls for ingress, but that's not the concern. No, that's that's uh, spot on. Uh, I also uh, work with a lot of companies, uh, and they have this, you know, somehow they have this uh, notion of just, you know, going with the CSP construct and then, okay, uh, life will be good. I'm not going to be um, pointed out for or for deploying something else. But, you know, the reality is that uh, if there is a breach or something, right, uh, it becomes your responsibility. It's not a shared responsibility model mm -hmm. there. What about the cost? Because I I was actually researching uh, recently, and you can also do that. You go to Google, you type, you know, net gateway cost, and people are just complaining about it. What's going on with that? Oh, yeah, that's um that's a real big part of it. Because when you deploy these NAT gateways, super easy button to get in. But once you're relying on it, using it, it's a little tricky to just rip that out because <laughs> your service depends on it. But mm. you're paying both an instance cost for that NAT gateway and you're paying data throughput costs. That's the one that gets you. You deploy it when that Apple service is kind of implemented, you know, brand new shiny VPC, you put the services in there, you throw it on, you allow egress. And then over time, as it's being used, the traffic increases. And next thing you know, your egress traffic bill is crazy high. Like if, if you jump on any of the forums, uh, like Stack Exchange or or like Reddit, like people were talking serious rage about the cost <laughs> of these egress traffic. It's not small. Um, it is substantial. I am curious if anyone on here um, uh, can share any experiences uh, around seeing a, a crazy high bill. Is, uh, is is this resonating with anyone? Feel free to just raise a hand if you or, or drop a drop something in the chat. Um, but we 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 keep hearing this is a real common problem. Yeah. So Rajesh yeah. is endorsing it. Oh yeah, I saw. There you go. Yeah. Cost is another factor there. I believe. Yeah, it's a yeah. But it, it's not even just the cost side of it. It's actually you know accountability and or you know auditability. It's like what is this data traffic that's flying out of my network? Where's Where is it, it coming from? What's generate? What where's it going? What's generating? What's talking on the inside? Is it something that our processes are generating? You know, is it something that our devices are initiating just because they're doing it, or is it something that's being triggered? You know, due to a flaw or some other you know other thing. Um, yeah. We. I've done some experiments in the past with various solutions of this, including like some fairly heavy instrumentation on all the servers to try and track what services and what processes and what box are actually generating what traffic. But it's, yeah, that's a rabbit hole. It's a nightmare. Um, yeah. And a lot of it, I mean, if it's an encrypted like stream, yeah, yeah. where is it going? Yeah. I mean, you, how much time have you got to go and like yeah. reverse map every external stream against its public IP across every container running in your environment or VM? Like, there's a lot before, more going on. Than, and and, than, and well, that's before you get to the dynamic and transitory like DNS stuff. And yeah, that's like, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but don't we, difficult problem. But don't we, yeah, but don't we have the, the VPC flow log, the VNet flow log? There, CSPs are providing this visibility or you know what do you want to see with it right bob or nathan yeah i mean yeah, yeah you've 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 first you've got to set all that up um it's it's not just out of the box here's visibility like you own okay. managing the configuration and setup of that you need to then make sure that any vpc that's stood up you're coming in there and setting all these things up you know the team that might be deploying a new vpc to create that service probably isn't a security team like like the the amount of Island VPCs people find in their own networks is huge. So you can't rely on a kind of pattern of afterthought kind of security yeah. around this. Like, like it, that's just, you only need one gap. Uh, and that's enough because hackers have all the time in the world to probe the kind of externals, like uh, surface area. Like, yeah, that's, I mean, sure, you could. It's operationally expensive. It takes a lot of time to do it. And then someone's got to go through all that data. Like, that, that, but what if, you know, multi-region, you've got hundreds of EPCs, which is not a lot these days. Like, it suddenly becomes a full-time job just trying to pass all of that and make sense of all of that. Yeah. Actually, that reminded me of uh, a customer I was uh, helping with. And uh, I mean, this is something coming from customers. So I'm working with a customer. We are talking about these all these benefits of aviatics and whatnot. And he actually pointed out a really good thing. He said, you know, Shazad, we have the VPC flow log, we have the VNet logs, but how do I actually marry them together? 
like how do i make this you know something out of it right i have to do this extra effort to do that right because sometimes they're not even complying right because no one is using the standard for the the flow log at least i'm not aware of of it if you are let me know but i came from the cisco background vmware background netflow was the standard right mm-hmm. here is no standard i don't see netflow running mm-hmm. in the in the cloud and you pointed out about the cost yeah when you are generating all those logs there is a cost to process those logs mm-hmm. right and then the cost to store those logs you are paying for all these these uh, costs over there so can avitrix help in that space because we are talking about the limitations but i think it's it's important yeah. for us to provide our audience some solutions as well yeah. be it avitrix be it something else Absolutely, but just one more point for it before I go to that. Um, there's also the fact that you've got multiple cloud providers and different services have different logging and information. Like, just just doing that competently, <laughs> like do, building it yourself that that metrics pipeline mm-hmm. and analysis across all the different services and the different cloud providers. Like, that's not Don't easy. Reveal. Um, that is super hard to do uh, unless you want to like be sixty percent good at a lot of different tools, and then then you're you know, stressing out your staff and uh, providing opportunities to fail. So, um, yeah, we we absolutely have a solution to this, which is why it's been so fun to work on. Mm. <laughs> it's not we we have we have an answer already, and I just want to preface with like, I know, I know it sounds like we've been beaten up on the cloud provider a little bit here. They didn't set out to solve all the things that we've been talking about when they created this NAT gateway. There was a need to provide an ability for services with private ips to not all need their own elastic ip address on the internet and a nat gate was was born and it provides that capability they they solved that thing it wasn't bad it's since then <laughs> that we found these gaps and that's what aviatrix has jumped ahead uh and solved i mean we we were the first transit gateway on aws uh aws actually came out with theirs later like this is what we do we see the gaps we get out there and we solve them ahead hmm. Um, so for the cloud perimeter security, that is the use case. I, there we go. Marketing. Couldn't help myself. I waited this long to get some marketing term out. Yeah, I do work in marketing. Uh, so <laughs> cloud perimeter security is the, is the name of the, the, uh, the, the use case we, we've made available. And that solution is replacing the AWS NAT, NAT gateways with an aviatrix gateway. Now from a NAT capability, uh, does everything and more so it's just a, a one-for-one swap out um we even automate the rewriting of the route table to switch it over from the net gateway to the aviatrix gateway so the time to cut in is incredibly fast like this is the fastest thing to go and implement in your network and the average cost before we get to security and visibility the average cost savings customers are seeing is 25 percent on that, just on that egress traffic, because for us, it's just an instant cost. It's a flat rate data egress cost. All right. Sorry. Okay. No, no data egress cost. It's a flat rate instance cost is what I'm going to say. That we don't, yeah. There isn't an egress traffic cost, which that is why we immediately see those savings. And in fact, that's just the average. We had one uh, just this week, the customer saved 80% of their wow. traffic costs. And they all they all they had to do, they deployed the Avatrix gateway. We automate that using our, our management. You just install Copilot and um, the controller. That's our management and, and control plane backend. That automates the deployment of the Avatrix gateway into the VPC. And then you, t- you tick a button in the management interface and it using those APIs in the cloud provider, it changes the route so the traffic moves from the NAT gateway over to the Aviatrix gateway. Done. You're immediately getting that cost saving and massive security uplift and centralized visibility across the entire estate. So you're paying right. less to <laughs> implement enterprise worthy security of your egress traffic and visibility, and then just observability and, and anomaly detection and just visibility of all of those net gateways across your estate. So I might be biased, but to me, that sounds like a little bit of a no-brainer pattern. Of just and not only am I no longer blind to what data exfiltration might be going on, but I can implement policies from one central interface and say, right, okay, this policy is going to run across every VPC and VNet and monitor all of the egress. And I no longer have that 
oh my God, when is it going to happen? Not if, when is the date of mm. exfiltration attack. In fact, it might have already happened and you don't even know. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so this I'm is talking. a lot of promises uh, we are making as aviatics. And I know some people are skeptical about it. And I get that, right? It's a very positive feedback. So my answer to this is that we have this course called ACE Security. It's only four to five hours long course. We have an awesome egress lab, secure egress lab in there. So if you are, if you want to believe what we said, just come to this course, take this lab, and I can actually show you the link of the uh, the lab uh, guide as well. It's a public facing lab guide, right? You can see what we cover there, and you will see it in action yourself. You don't have to believe what we say. You want to try it out? Come to a security course. You'll see it in action. Cool. Uh, how Any. Quick question, how much overlap is there between that and the Ace Pro course? If you have taken the Ace Pro course, that lab is also covered. In think, it. So okay, have, I'm, just, I'm just checking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you would have done it already. But I'm just saying because the Ace security is only four to five hours, people sometimes mm -hmm. they don't have time to sit through the you know three days oh, course. Yeah. <laughs> if you just want to see this use case, a specific use case, uh, you can just take that training. And uh, whoever is attending the call, we can make it uh, make it free. This the course. Otherwise, it has a cost. Obviously, the labs are expensive, and then the cost of training is also there. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Any? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, what's the chance of integrating this with the Edge VM? What is your definition of Edge VM? Uh, the Aviatrix appliance that you install on site. Oh, okay. So basically, because... you want the egress feature on the Edge. Can yeah, because essentially, because this, this is something I'm actually looking at at the moment, um, is traditional data center architecture, traditional, um, uh, basically moving data, traditional data center architecture to more in line with the VPC kind of model, uh, you know, the cloud model, and basically getting the infrastructure on site. And, you know, you've got, you know, the edge, the edge VM is really intended for like, um, uh, branch offices and that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's also got internet access and, you know, people have got PCs in those locations. So that would strike me as a really handy place to actually have this kind of technology. And then the other thing as well that I'm looking at is seeing, um, and, it, you know, this is some further digging I've got to get into, but um, the, the ability to actually integrate on-prem environments using Aviatrix as a security plane. Uh, which would be really, really nice because that with them starts to make the transition to cloud a lot easier. So it's in other words, if you're dealing with your own physical infrastructure, you basically have your Aviatrix environment and you've got all the benefits of doing the Aviatrix way. And then if you need to uplift services up into the cloud, it makes it a lot easier. Um, but also for branch, you know, people's PCs get squirrely stuff on it. You know, I, I worked at a recruitment consultant for a while and they're trained to mm. click on every PDF, every Word doc, every single booby trap that possibly is. Uh, you know, go, go to every social media site because they're looking for people to hire. So yeah, uh, that that's, makes for a really, really interesting uh, you know, defensive model that you have to put into place. And they have access to the core databases. So it's like, pff, go through the edge now instead of attacking the core database. So that's definitely something where this is actually of interest. That's a really interesting question in all transparency. I never looked at this on an edge thing because I just wanted to solve this initial kind of stuff getting out of cloud. Yeah. That is in no way a no, <laughs> it can't yeah. be done. Um, yeah. But I, I love the question and I wanna, I wanna, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm struggling to see why not. Um, and I wanna answer a question in the chat as part of my answer to you as well about the traction of the distributed cloud firewall. We are using distributed cloud firewall policies to manage that egress traffic. So this is part of that solution. Um, that is what you get with the security part of this. We have some starter packs. Um, in fact, if you go to aviatrix.com right there, front and center on the banner, it says start saving money, click that link and you'll hit the um, cloud perimeter security page. You'll see those starter packs. It includes everything. It includes distributed firewall. It includes um the advanced visibility module so you'll get all the functionality on those spoke gateways um right away and they're sold in like five pack 10 pack and 15 pack licenses as in five vpcs 10 vpc 15 vpcs as, as a launch pad so that's using distributed cloud firewall 
um, to get that happening. So yeah, uh, definitely distributed cloud firewall. I mean, it's it's not front and center in the branding of it, but it's definitely powering it. It is mm-hmm. it is very much there. Yeah. So Rob, that's a very good question. And I like Nathan said, I don't know the answer. If we can use the AVTX Edge appliance sitting on the on premise and create mm-hmm. this internet breakout, right? From the technology point of view, uh, you know, I can sh- say f- uh, with authority that yes, we can do that. But from the business point of view, I don't know if they have enough request from customers to basically support this feature, right? That's number one. Number two, you mentioned about the 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 extension of the cloud operating model towards the on-premise data center, right? So in order for us to get to that point or even further, we have enabled a new feature called the Edge as Transit. Okay? okay, very powerful. Just 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 sink it in. So the Edge before was the spoke gateway, like the spoke yeah. gateway sitting in the on-premise, but now the Edge sitting in the on-premise, the Aviatics Edge I'm talking about, can act as a transit. It's a big deal. Okay, it's that's, like huge. that's huge. That's huge. That's huge. Okay. Right. So we are getting there. And with the enough business uh, data behind the, this type of request, I'm pretty sure we can do it in, in no time. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Th- that, that's, that's the thing I'm thinking. It's like, I don't think many yeah. people will be asking for it because many people aren't thinking cloud way. You know, but traditionally it's like, uh, I've got my on prem stuff and I've got the cloud stuff and the two are not related. But if you've got a use case and you can show that, it's like, well, actually, you can introduce this, you know, because people mm. like, oh, I'm about to refresh all my firewalls because the old ones are out and everything else. Well, we put put a commodity appliance in and then use that as your layer and then basically build out from that. And you've got the unified um, yeah, infrastructure. You know, you've got your co-pilot, you've got DTF, you've got unified policy that goes across the whole place. You know, that's the problem a lot of enterprises have is like managing, you know, hundreds or thousands of sites and making sure that all the policies are actually unified and are actually accurate and also from a data gathering point of view it's huge but also from a mm. attack surface you know that's the thing that you know i was getting at with you've got your pcs that you know out there they're not the database mm. itself but they've got access True. to the database and it's True. like out in the periphery and no one's paying attention to it that's that's no. a that's a big win no that's a spot on yeah we'll, we'll get to this so okay muhammad is asking can we reduce at minimum cost of in and out data transfer. Yes, absolutely, Mohammed. That's what we do, right? So when you have, especially for the egress traffic, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is in context for the egress traffic. Two-part two answer to that. I mean, yes, just the visibility and knowing what's going on, you can go around and just set up an allow list and everything else just won't make it out there. So it's only the traffic you want going on. So you can just block a lot of stuff. Um, so you just have the visibility side. And then also you just flat cost, instance cost. Mm. So you know, it's less of an issue um, as to how much is going out, even if it's only the desired traffic now being allowed in that allow list. Yeah. And the second question I see is, Arender, what's the traction in the market for DCF? The answer is huge, humongous. Um, it's like a hot selling cake for us. Because it, 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 it makes sense. It's not because, you know, I'm trying to sell it. If you think about it, right, cloud by nature is distributed. People were craving for the distributed architecture people were fed up with this hairpin effect to send all the traffic to the centralized firewall, right? So now we have given this option. So it's definitely a very successful feature within our product line. The second part of your question is that, can it help reduce the overall firewall related cost? Absolutely. And again, the I can give you the data and then you, if you think about the architecture, you will get it easily, right? So the first thing first is that now you have this Aviatrix distributed firewall sitting in the VPC or VNet, okay? As soon as your virtual machine or EC2 is sending the traffic, it's basically expected by this firewall inside the VPC. So there is no egress charge. With the centralized model, the biggest challenge is that you have to send all this traffic to the centralized location. So you're paying for this egress cost, right? Plus your firewall must be beefy in a cluster format or whatever the case may be to cater for all the traffic that is coming to them, right? So majority of the time they are sitting idle, okay? So you're only seeing a spike when when there is a Christmas time or or Thanksgiving, but you have to account for that traffic, right? Now you're saving on that cost as well. The cost of the instance of virtual machine, if you look at it uh, from the Palo Alto perspective or, or Fortinet perspective, is huge. The license cost is huge, right? So now you have all this data expected at the VPC VNet level, so there is no egress cost. So it 
by itself is humongous uh, cost saving out there. And some, something I just want to raise that um, when, when you're doing it centralized and you're bringing like next generation firewall virtual appliances, so that's an architecture made for on-prem brought to the cloud as a VM. Um, and you do that centralized because that's the only way to be sane with <laughs> the operational, <laughs> what it takes to run that. You're, that. That's kind of a cloud anti-pattern because you're managing pets, not cattle. Everyone's heard that kind of pets versus cattle sort of uh analogy like the cloud is all about managing cattle patterns just repeatable patterns everywhere with uh, abatrix's distributed cloud firewall which is used in this use case this cloud premise use case the enforcement is local to the traffic so it's done at the egress point so simplicity in architecture performance in that it's right there at the egress point but it's managed centrally so we've overcome two problems there with bringing traditional kind of on-prem architecture to the cloud we freed up that pets problem and turned it into managing like a, instead of a fleet of pets, we now got cattle that we're managing and we're doing it with one place to manage that policy that is enforced locally at the workload. No, that's great. Okay, so I let's see another question from Muhammad. For edge egress will conflict with egress transit as MTT, the, you, I think you mean multi-tier transit? The answer is no. So depending on what you want to do, right? Because this actually in the context of the discussion we had earlier, where this edge is running as a, a, in the on-premise and providing the internet breakout or internet egress, right? So once we have that feature, the feature would allow you to specify how do you want to treat this feature, okay? So you have this VPC one, VPC two, do you want this traffic to go out towards the on-premise and get out from the egress? Right, that, is that the policy you want to implement or you want this VPC VNet to send the traffic directly to internet, right? So we'll give you this option from the policy point of view. So no, it will not conflict with your egress transit or MTT, multi-tier transit option. I wanna just jump back to uh, Ravindra's uh, question, just, just in case we didn't get to it um, fully. Yeah. I think what you're asking about is FireNet, which was our capability of steering traffic to those traditional kind of fleets of uh, traditional firewall appliances, that is not uh, the solution. That was a way of leveraging your existing traditional architecture uh, firewalls by us steering the traffic to them. This does not require that at all. They can be uh, replaced um, because we have the firewall capabilities in, and this I'm getting to the other question, the last one by Rajesh now, um, it's part of that edge, that spoke gateway that's deployed in the VPC where we're doing that policy enforcement. It's that same point. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully I answered both those questions sufficiently yep. there. Yep, yep, you did. So any any other question, Rajesh, Ravindra, I see all these questions. I'm going to, um, yeah. I'm going to super quickly just, I'm going to drop a link to my uh LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with all you awesome people who have been asking these great questions. Um, and yeah, like uh, c connect on LinkedIn. I'd love to uh, hear more about your experiences with these. Please definitely do all the things that shows I've been talking about, like the, the ACE program. And also next week, I think, maybe the week after, big shout out to Steve Brewer, my, my buddy who's going to be doing an incredible demo video of this cloud perimeter security use case. Um, just how to set up the policies, how to deploy uh, the, the gateway. You'll see it's all automated and we use the cloud APIs to kind of do the implementation. It is so crazy fast how quick you can start saving money while uplifting security and getting a statewide visibility uh, across regions, clouds, everything. So we'll have that video coming out. So if you want to see that, um, absolutely follow me on LinkedIn. I just dropped that in because I'm going to be Posting that out there and making a bit of noise about that. And you'll see that coming very soon. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I think this is uh, a very good discussion. We discuss um, very important. So, but I'm biased. You know, we're pretty yeah. cool. We're pretty <laughs> <Me too>. cool. <laughs> so really good discussion. Love the interaction from the, from the audience. Um, we are now getting towards the end of our, our official office hours. But like Nathan said, the discussion should continue, uh, you know, connect us via LinkedIn or follow our YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, let this discussion going. So before we hand it over to Katie, Nathan, anything uh, interesting you want to mention 
any code from a customer, any public reference customer, anything that comes to your mind, or maybe something very interesting, nothing to do with the with the with the with the technology, man. Just go with your side or something. Something completely <laughs> different, interesting. You know what? I'm big on mindset and growth. This, we're going to go serious, random, but you asked. You asked. Remember this? You did this. Yes. I'm all about like growth. Like I came, I came from Australia, which is very like you know, I'm very, very rough edges. If you hurt yourself, you were told rub some dirt on it, stop your whining. And I'm trying to undo a lot of that because that's just how, how I was brought up. You know, <laughs> soften the edges a little, develop some emotional intelligence. And so last night I was at my first rehearsal for my part in the Nutcracker this year. I'm going to be doing a ballet, mm. which I, you have no idea how much it terrifies me because I'm the mouse king in the Nutcracker this year, <laughs> put on by the Santa Rosa Dance Theatre. So, um, I, hey, you asked for I out think, there. Like, I think we should just stop here. <laughs> Let's move on from, from me in tights looking like a complete yes. fool. Mindset development. That's that's the thing I'm I'm all about. You gotta you gotta push yourself. You gotta always if you're uncomfortable, you're learning. And I'm mm. I'm all about that. I can give you a hundred different other crazy things I've made myself do just in the last couple of years. And uh, it really works. Broadens your horizons, that's for sure. And now I'm immediately asking myself, why did I just tell a whole bunch of people on the internet this? <laughs> don't come. Don't this will watch. live forever. Please. This will live forever. Katie, over to you before we go somewhere else. Yeah, no more stories about Nathan and tights. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is the last office hours of 2024. So stay tuned for our 2025 calendar. We'll probably get that posted in the next month or so. Um, I did drop a, a, a survey link in the chat. It would be so, so valuable uh, for us as we're thinking about what this program looks like in 2025. Um, if you could give us your feedback, it should only take about a minute. You can also request future topics there. So um, we look forward to seeing everybody in 2025 and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Friday. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks okay. for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye.